All right, fantastic. Well, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are in the world. Uh, welcome to our second special session for the Dome Dialogues e-conferences. This is Introduction to Worldwide Telescope, and we have uh, quite an illustrious group of presenters this evening. Um, I really just want to get myself out of the way and, and get to the good stuff. Uh, but before we begin, just a quick overview of how we tend to facilitate uh, the Zoom meetings here in the e-conference series. If you have questions or comments during the presentations, please feel free to put uh, your questions in the chat. Uh, there are a number of us who are watching the chat at all times and we'll be able to, to interact with you during there, uh, the presenters as well. If you open up your participants window, you should also be able to raise your hand digitally. And what that will do is move you to the top of the list. It'll queue you up for a question. And when we uh, we go to, to question times, we've got you in a row so that we can go through and, 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 uh, uh, and call everybody up. Uh, but of course, uh, since this is being live streamed, since this is uh, a series of presenters and demonstrations, we ask that if you're not speaking, that you do mute yourself. Uh, we just want to make sure that there's as little background noise as possible. All of the hosts can share their screens. So you'll be seeing that change on and off throughout the evening. Uh, but really, the, the catalyst for tonight, uh, other than the fact that we're trying to uh, professionally develop this community as much as possible uh, was through the work of Sean Latch um, from the University of Maine, from the Amherst Astronomy Center. Uh, and I'm gonna turn it over to Sean, let him do the introductions and, uh, and kick off uh, what we think will be a really, really great evening. So Sean, turn it over to you. Uh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so I want to give a special thank you to our, our three presenters tonight, uh, Peter Williams, uh, Jonathan Fay, and uh, David Weigel. And uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot other than that we're sort of co-branding this with Dome Dialogues and uh, IPS's Data to Dome Initiative, which is uh, led by our illustrious president, Mark Subarau. Um, and we're really thrilled uh, that uh, the three of you can present to us this evening. Uh, Worldwide Telescope, as, as a lot of you know, has been out there for a while. Um, and it's usable in multiple forms and, and in the planetarium along with kiosk form and, and on your desktop and things like that. So uh, without further ado, I think I'll turn things over to uh, Peter Williams, uh, who will sort of kick things off and get things going. And I'm also going to just sort of be in the background trying to help uh, from there. All right. Thanks, John. Uh, thanks for having us. Uh, he really took the lead in, in getting us on this. And I think it's going to be great to show off what we've been up to to 62 people. Uh, so. My name is Peter Williams. I work at the American Astronomical Society, which is the uh, nonprofit scholarly society of astronomers and astrophysicists that sponsors the Worldwide Telescope Project right now. Uh, so you might know that it came out of Microsoft and Microsoft Research, and then a few years ago uh, transitioned to be uh, overseen by the AAAS. And um, so my background is astrophysics, and I'm really actually not much of a planetarium person at all, so I don't want to talk too much. I want to hand it off to the people who know what they're talking about. Um, I just want to say that uh, as a nonprofit scholarly society, uh, you know, the AAAS is really interested in, um, you know, providing a product that will always be free to use and open source and something that we really hope can uh, get a sense of kind of ownership by the broader community. And um, over the past few years, uh, we've been doing a lot of work on the kind of open source infrastructure and all the tools that are underlying Worldwide Telescope. And I think there's a lot of really neat stuff happening. Um, and so we'd love for you to get involved. Uh, we have a new forum website, which is at www.forum.org. I'll type that into the chat, uh, where if you wanna start using it, you, know, you run into anything based on what you see tonight, uh, please hop on there. That's the place to to start talking with other people who are interested in the program. Um, yeah, other than that, uh, tonight, uh, Jonathan will be showing you the Windows program, which is a thing that will drive a dome up to, you know, the scale of Adler Planetarium or whatever it might be. Uh, but we also have this web version of the program where I think there's a lot of interesting stuff happening. And especially in uh, these unprecedented times, as people are wont to say, uh, there's a lot of interesting things that we can happen where we can show the same kinds of data sets and tours in the dome and also in a person's web browser. And I think there's a lot of really opportunities there which tie in well with the data dome initiative. And so that's one thing that I hope is especially to really uh, be seeing some exciting progress on in the coming year. 
So I think that's all I wanted to say. So um, I'll hand it off to Jonathan Fay, who is the uh, the guru who conceived and implemented the program, and is who knows everything about it. Uh, he's an architect at Microsoft and um, is responsible for the amazing thing that you're about to see. So uh, Jonathan, please take it away. Um, hi. Um, there's uh, been a, actually a, uh, a very large uh, contribution. Um, the uh, Worldwide Telescope, there were really uh, uh, three people who, who got it um, started in, at Microsoft Research, but it immediately was a collaboration with uh, people in the planetarium and astroviz community. In fact, uh, I think at one of the astroviz workshops um, that Curtis Wong went to, um, I think 2006 or something like that, a lot of the connections of people who are still actively involved in Worldwide Telescope was made. Um, and uh, Mark Subrow was the first person outside of uh, uh, Microsoft to contribute source code to WWT when we went open source. Uh, and we're transitioning over to the AAS. So there's been um, a significant uh, involvement of um, the planetarium community and worldwide telescope from uh, the very beginning. Um, one of the cool things about um, the worldwide telescope is that each of the versions that um, we have are very focused on the medium that it's being delivered. So the planetarium version of it um, is really optimized to be able to do uh, full dome and to be able to really use all the tools and everything like that. The web version is designed to be able to deliver content in a browser and to have be, people to be able to author. But the interoperability, um, you know, and then the, the Python version of it, the PyWWT version, you can actually do data processing and bring data um, uh, into the Worldwide Telescope ecosystem. But what's great is that all of that ecosystem can interact and you can share data, you can share tours, you can share imagery uh, throughout that whole process. So a scientist doing research can use PyWWT to visualize their data and then bring it out and publish it on a web version and then be able to show it in full dome. And so that whole ecosystem from start to beginning can be uh, performed. So I'm gonna go ahead and start sharing my screen here um, let's go ahead and um, bring this in here. And um, we should see, um, so we did a trial of this and the fr uh, frame refresh rate on Zoom is not as smooth as we'd like for um, realistically. It's butter smooth for me, but by the time you guys see it, it may be choppy. Um, that's not the experience you'll get in real life with it. Uh, so for here, um, Worldwide Telescope started out and one of our, our um, you know, uh, uh, coolest modes is this all sky environment where you have multispectral all sky all the way down to one arc second per pixel. So you can smoothly zoom in um, anywhere you want in the sky as and looking at sky on the sphere. And we have a one terapixel um, seamless panorama of the sky that we produced uh, specifically for Worldwide Telescope um, that uses uh, DSS as the original imagery. And so you have, you know, down to an arc second per pixel where you can go in and, and view things. But the uh, really cool part is that it's, it's um, because it's multispectral, you can bring in, um, surveys from all sorts of different bands. And so you can bring in the sky from radio all the way to gamma. And so um, some of the things are uh, useful for, for being able to have context where you can look at things in multiple bands. So for instance, right here, um, we're looking at this object here and we're seeing um, this nebula. And uh, if we look in, um, if we look in here and go ahead and set this X-ray as a foreground layer, we can see uh, the X-ray version of it, and then we can actually pan in here and crossfade over to um, the visible light version of it. And as you can see here, this is a supernova shell expanding. 
And so you can uh, correlate very uh, um, easily the x-ray and crossfade into the visual uh, for it. Um, this is one of the- Jonathan, Mark suggests that um, there is an optimized for video setting that might help with uh, making things a little bit smoother. I don't know where it lives exactly, but if you- um, you, you, um, you see that when you, when you first share. So you'll have to actually have to unshare and then share again. Oh, thank you. I'm not much of a Zoom guy. Um, let's go ahead and click screen. And then at the bottom, you should oh, see. Ops, optimize uh, for uh, sharing the video clip. OK. Uh, let's see. How does this work now? Is this better? Yeah, much better. Yeah, I agree. Yes, definitely. OK, so thank you. Um, you saved the rest of the demo, I guess. Um, so, so now that we're looking uh, here in X-ray, we can look at other uh, sources. So right up here, we can find this other X-ray source that we might not have had any indication what this was. But since we uh, saw the other version with X-ray and um, looked at the uh, visible light, if this is also a supernova shell, we should be able to zoom in towards the edges of this and then maybe see a visible light signature in this as well. And so when we do, we can see this very nebula. I hope the video is coming out so you can actually <laughs> uh, see this. Usually I'm in dark, you know, or bright rooms where uh, the screen is too dark or something like that. Hopefully this will, uh, you'll be able to see the, vi the visuals for that better. So um, that gives you a little bit of an idea with being able to bring in uh, all of these all uh, all sky um, uh, surveys and and put them together, um, but we also uh, you can bring in things like uh, individual images and we have uh, published from um, uh, uh, feeds from great telescopes, you know, great observatories and and um, um, other uh, um, institutions that have a lot of EPO imagery. So when you can click on like a Hubble image here, uh, we can go ahead and, and select this image here and go ahead and um, zoom in on it. And now what we're gonna see here is the Hubble image overlaid over uh, top of, of the uh, background. Now these uh, types of functionality, um, you know, was pretty groundbreaking when we uh, were introduced, but that was like more than 10, 12, <laughs> 13 years ago now or something like that. So um, this is becoming fairly common, uh, you know, common functionality to be able to have, um, uh, you know, images and bring them in. Um, but uh, one of the things that in a, in a planetarium software that you can also bring in um, things like your own uh, uh, data and models and things like that are also uh, something that is, um, is key bringing in um, uh, to, to be able to have your own imports and to be able to have some data that's curated for you, but also to be able to have your own collections. So we have um, uh, up in the, the top here, this Explore panel that lets you uh, preview um, these different collections of curated images that are available from uh, the various planetariums and, uh, I'm sorry, the various um, uh, uh, EPO uh, sites, et cetera. But you also have uh, community content that you can share. So you can uh, bring in your own collections of images. You can uh, take any data that has AVM uh, content in it. So uh, that's from the VAMP AVM project. And so if you have other images, um, you can load them in and register them uh, to the sky and be able to, to see them. Um, of course, uh, no planetarium um, software would be complete without being able to have uh, things like, you know, constellations and, and um, uh, grids and all sorts of other things. So you can uh, bring in, um, you know, all the, the typical types of grids and, and constellation pictures and figures and things like that and bring them in. Um, and uh, all of the um, navigation of a lot of the base features are all available through this layer manager. So any of the, the um, built-in functionality and visualizations, um, as well as uh, things like 
uh, the solar system planets, and then functionality and features that you have uh, for being able to turn on different um, uh, uh, displays like Milky Way, cosmic background radiation, um, planetary orbits, lunar orbits, and things like that. These are all available over here on the layer manager. So Worldwide Telescope has um, the sky mode, which allows you to basically see the entire sky. But we also have um, a, a mode for browsing the universe. It's um, uh, called, it's labeled the solar system mode, but it's not just the solar system. It's the um, uh, everything from, um, you know, submeter resolution on Earth and a uh, few meters on Mars and, and and all the way up to the large scale structure of the universe. And so it's it gives you um, the, the ability to browse the universe. For the planetarium mode, we have, you know, you can use the desktop mode if you want to sort of control and drag around. But we also have some specialized driving tools. Uh, so you can actually uh, set up uh, orbits and rotations and um, you can go ahead and, and click on uh, these user controls and you can actually have a, sort of an autopilot. So if you want to uh, start a zoom in here, you can have a zoom in or a zoom out and you can set it and then you can start navigating around by moving around um, and saying how you want the camera to move. And then when you're done, you can push the stop button and you can come to a stop. Um, so um, when you want to, if we want to fly into something like Earth, we can use this context panel below. And this shows us uh, the different things of interest on the screen. So if you're in the sky mode, and you're zoomed in on an area, it'll show you various images and objects that are interesting in that area. Um, for this here, uh, we've moved into the soul, uh, to the uh, Earth, and we can come in and fly into Earth and uh, zoom in. And, and uh, let's go ahead and, and visit Seattle here. Um, I wish I could turn the clouds off this easily in real life. Um, We'll head in here and uh, go ahead and uh, tilt down a little bit as we come through the atmosphere. What, so this allows you to um, uh, do live driving. You can also use things like joysticks and um, um, uh, Xbox controllers and other sorts of things. You can, um, if you're uh, browsing by yourself, you can use the mouse, um, but it might be a little bit more jarring if you're driving for, for public. Uh, the simulation is ongoing. So as you see right now, if I just stop here, you're gonna be seeing the earth uh, revolving in time. Um, we can move time uh, by looking at the view tab here we can move time faster or slower, and you can actually watch the simulation move forward. And this gives you the ability to uh, uh, change your time, um, change your location where you're viewing from when you wanna see things from a certain location in the sky when you're in the sky mode. And it allows you to uh, see the locations in the future of uh, the planets, solar systems, and so we can move back out here um, and then see uh, your, the, the rest of uh, our own solar system. We can turn on, um, we can turn on the uh, asteroid uh, belt and be able to turn on individual uh, sections of them and have them color coded. Um, we can move out into the stars around our area through the, our volumetric Milky Way. I'm not sure how well this comes in terms of uh, uh, how smooth it's video wise. Uh, Mark, can you tell me, is the video relatively smooth or is it jerky right now? No, it's, it's not bad at all. 
Okay. So you can come through our vol volumetric Milky Way and you can come out to the Sloan galaxies and all the way out to, uh, uh, to the cosmic background radiation and you can zoom back in. So um, this is a, you know, functional, functionally wise, there's a lot of planetarium software that have, uh, you know, some similar functionality in this case. Um, one of the things that we have um, is, is also being able to bring in your own models into this um, so that you can bring in your own orbit. So for instance, uh, uh, I can go ahead and, and come into the sun and I can uh, go ahead and add a minor planet at, um, and I can add it either as a reference frame if I wanna put a model there or I can add it as an orbit line. So um, uh, let's say, um, uh, put in Sedna here. And so if you notice, uh, I just typed in the name, it went to the Minor Planet Center, and now we have Sedna's orbit uh, for, the, for us here. Um, we can also do things like, um, if we wanna create, um, um, we're, we're around Earth and say we want to bring in a model of the Hubble Space Telescope. Well, the first thing we want to do is get the orbit of the satellite uh, that we want to do. And this can be, um, this can be done for, uh, you know, any uh, satellite. But in this case, uh, we're going to do it for Hubble. So we're going to say Hubble um, orbits. And uh, so, um, let's see, uh, orbital elements, okay. So we'll search for that and we have this page here uh, from heavens above and uh, here's the Hubble Space Telescope. So I'm gonna click on this page here and I'm gonna hit Control A for select all and then I'm gonna hit Control C for copy. And then I'm going to go into um, Earth and I'm going to go ahead and create a new reference frame. And I'm going to call this Hubble. And I'm going to say that it's a orbital reference frame. Um, I'm going to say it's about 10 meters. Um, it's got station keeping. We're going to show the orbit and show it as a point at a distance. We can change the color of the orbit if we want. And then now we're going to have the uh, orbital position of this. Um, so this, uh, I, I just went to that page and I literally copied the entire HTML contents of that page. And I can hit paste and it scanned through the contents of my clipboard and it extracted the orbital elements um, from that. So if someone, if you have a TLE that's printed in the page um, anywhere, it will find out the first valid TLE and be able to import it. Um, if you had a collection of 10 satellites that were on the same page, it would only um, in, import the first one. But this basically means you don't have to hand copy a bunch of orbits or something so that if you have any place where that's a source of orbital ephemeris, you can get that in. If you want to point, uh, put, uh, point some, um, enter data, um, by yourself, you can just go ahead and enter all the orbital elements. And as long as you have six of them um, for a, um, a, a proper um, Keplerian orbit, um, you can go ahead and do that. So now we have this, and then we, um, um, we should be able to have, uh, yeah, there we go. So we have Hubble, and you can see Hubble's orbit there. So now what we can do here is go ahead and track this frame. And so now we're um, tracking where Hubble uh, should be, but we want to go ahead and uh, get a Hubble uh, a space telescope image, so um, or model. So I'm going to go over here and I'm going to go Hubble uh, 3D model, and I'm just searching on um, uh, online here and. Uh, Okay, let's see. There's, uh, we can look for things like 3DS files and stuff like that, or OBJ files. Um, I think there's, uh, 
uh, Celestia Mother Load is a source of uh, um, um, yeah. So here we go. This is a uh, um, a website that has stuff for Celestia, uh, another um, uh, desktop planetarium software, and so we can actually. Um, go ahead and, and select the model from this. And so let's go ahead and say spacecraft Earth orbit. Uh, well, that's spacecraft. Let's see, is that, uh, um, find Hubble here. So here's Hubble Space Telescope. And um, we can go ahead and, and download that. Um, And so this has taken a little bit of time here, but now um, we can go ahead and, and load that uh, um, into our, uh, our orbit. I guess this is, I have a gigabit uh, at home. I'm not sure why uh, a 10 megabyte model is taking so long, but okay. So let's go ahead and, and open in the folder. Um, I'm going to go ahead and unblock this, go in here, and here's this big Hubble. Um, so I'll go ahead and copy this out, um, paste it into my C drive, come in here. And the one thing I'm going to change here is I'm going to grab, uh, select all the textures out of here because this, they're in a different folder apparently than the model. And I'm just going to paste them in the same folder as the model. Okay, so now um, I've gotten my asset locally on my hard drive and I can come in here and I can say add and then uh, uh, big Hubble 3DS, let's open that and go into model and here is the 3DS model and look what we have here. So, um, I went from, uh, you know, an internet search to having a very nice looking model of Hubble um, sitting in my, uh, in my um, uh, uh, worldwide telescope here. And now the question is, is what can I do with something like this? And so um, besides being able to uh, you know fly around and look at images and things like that interactively, uh, Worldwide Telescope has this powerful twerk, uh, twerk creation facility um, that lets you um, create your own tours or play back other people's tours. And this is the way that you can exchange data. So you can store off individual layers. You can store off collections of layers and send them to people or individual images. But by creating a tour, you, you can package everything together along with narrative, dialogue, et cetera, into a tour. So we're gonna go ahead and, and create a tour here. Uh, we're gonna call this, you know, Hubble. And um, uh, you can type in information about the tour. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and skip that for now, but you can put in author information, you can classify it and do other things like that. So now, um, this right here, uh, the blue lines on the side, this is the safe area if you want to compose for like a, um, you know, a screen or something like that. Um, but you can choose to like compose for a full dome. So one of the things I can actually do is turn on a full dome view here where, um, where here we are in orbit um, and we can see uh, the Hubble Space Telescope, um, we can go ahead and um, uh, compose for this and go ahead and change what our, our dome tilt is. And so now we can um, uh, uh, go ahead and, and change the, the tilt of where, where the dome's looking at. So now we can actually have uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and, um, and uh, see what it would look like in the full dome environment. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and turn this off for the time being, but I just want to let you know that this is available here uh, so that you can preview an author for something that will look good in a full dome environment um, or something that will also um, work for 
a full screen. So any of the tours that were authored for a desktop environment can be played back in full dome and they will just play sort of in the sweet spot that's set up for the dome. Um, so if you have like a, a dome that's uh, seating in the round, it might be on, at the top of the dome, or if you have a forward facing dome, it might be tilted down at about 45 degrees or something in that range. Um, so Worldwide Telescope slides, um, uh, Worldwide Telescope uh, slide controls allow you to um, go ahead and keyframe um, either through very simple keyframing where you have, uh, where you can create a slide and then you can change an orientation um, and then right click on the slide and set an end camera position. And then it will interpolate between all of the settings and positions that you had when you started um, and then um, move smoothly to the end position. So now when I play this back, it's going to start from the original position and it's going to smoothly interpolate uh, to where we are. So I can uh, put together multiple slides here. And then so here I can then maybe move, you know, far back into the background or I can zoom in uh, uh, and uh, then uh, set another end position. Um, I can also uh, transition to um, looking at something else. So for instance, we can talk about Hubble for a few seconds, and then we can go ahead and go to the sky. And then um, let's go ahead and reset the camera. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, uh, find something that I want to look at here and say, um, um, uh, let's go ahead and find a, a Hubble image here. So we'll click on um, the Orion. Here we go. So we're going to go ahead and, and end up here. I am on the conference. That's the part about call, call kids trying to come in. So now um, I, I can go back to, I can go back to my tour. Unfortunately, uh, let's see. Ah, um, my menus are being blocked by the Zoom. Okay, there we go. So now I can uh, set a start position on here, and then I can set an end position over here. And uh, let's go ahead and uh, delete the middle slide. And then what I can do is uh, make a transition where we cross fade from one to another. And then let's make this uh, so something like 14, or let's see, 14 seconds long. So now when I play this back here, we're gonna be showing Hubble moving from its begin to end position. And then at a certain point, we can cross fade in and now we're going to be looking at um, the nebula. So um, the uh, timing of how uh, 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 these work uh, can be enhanced by using keyframe system, which uh, you can turn any slide um, and turn on uh, the keyframe uh, system. And David uh, Wagle is going to uh, walk through some of that with you in, in a couple of minutes when I hand things over to him. And he'll go through a sort of a more sophisticated uh, view of how to author for, for keyframes. Um, before um, I hand over to David, um, I wanted to talk about some of the other cool things that you can do for, for, uh, for full, full dome systems. So we talked about the driving controls here. But all of the settings in Worldwide Telescope um, can be connected up to uh, MIDI controllers and things like that. So um, let me see, I think this is APC40. Um, uh, this is a, um, uh, this is a, for instance, a MIDI controller that you can get for um, a couple of hundred dollars that um, each one of these buttons 
can be programmed uh, to uh, any worldwide telescope functionality to toggle things on and off. You can fade orbits in and out by putting sliders on there. Um, you can cross fade images. And so essentially you can create your own physical console where you actually map individual buttons and individual controls to functionality. So if you want to do something that's a live um, interactive program, um, where you essentially set up all your assets and connect up things uh, to a physical control, you can do that. Um, Worldwide Telescope also has um, the ability to set up controls. Uh, so for instance, if you go into settings here, uh, let's go ahead and uh, click on Xbox control. Um, so you can actually set up an Xbox controller and either uh, use the default mappings that we provide, or you can create a custom mapping in which you can uh, take any of the functionality in Worldwide Telescope and map it to the buttons and the joysticks, um, et cetera, so that you can do this. And then you can share the profiles for these with other people so that they can um, use similar uh, setups in, in their uh, environment. Um, you also um, you also can create um, special um, custom buttons where you want to create any sort of automation target that you want. Um, and so, you know, uh, my tool here, and you can create buttons and sliders and check boxes, and then you can map any of those um, to various uh, um, settings and actions. Um, navigation, et cetera. So any of the types of controls that you can map to, to uh, physical buttons and controls like um, the uh, Xbox controller or um, you know, MIDI controllers or other things like that, you can also map them to physical buttons and you can also map them through a network protocol to any other sorts of uh, connections. Um, also, when you're authoring tours, um, one of the things that you can do is to be able to add music and add voiceover. Um, in some circumstances, like for instance, uh, Mark Subrow um, had put together a, a, uh, um, a special uh, a planetarium show in Worldwide Telescope, um, in which they had a multi-track audio composed for it um, uh, 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 with uh, amazing music and, and everything like that. And instead of actually putting the music tracks in here, they had a multi-channel uh, uh, system in the planetarium theater that would run the theater. And here we put the SMPTE click track into the audio. And so what that would do is as you were editing the show, it would actually, the output of that, the master PC was plugged in to be able to run the theater audio system so that you could have the multi-channel audio synchronized with the show. And so, um, with that, you could jump around to different parts of the uh, uh, show and preview different parts of it, and the music would uh, synchronize with that portion of the show as we're playing that. Um, so there's also, of course, um, uh, being able to load in FITS files, being able to load in uh, other data. If you can take uh, things like um, uh, any sort of spreadsheet tabular data, uh, comma separated values, other types of uh, tables like that, you can bring them in and load them up as a layer and visualize them. Um, one of the other modes we have is to be able to look at a planet individually. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn off the Hubble layer here and we can look at something like Earth here. Um, we can we can see Earth without day and night, without lighting, without other sort of effects on it. Um, and without uh, the model of the solar system um, lighting and everything like that going. So this is not going to move, you know, 600 to 1,000 miles an hour underneath us. Um, and so we can use this to be able to, like, plot data or um, be able to, uh, you know, um, uh, individually look at this. So we could either fly in from the universe into Earth or we could treat Earth as just sort of uh, an individual map. And so um, uh, some of our, uh, some cities and everything like that have things like, for instance, this is the uh, uh, Seattle Seahawks uh, Stadium here at CenturyLink Field. And so we actually have, uh, you know, some of our environments where you have the 3D environment uh, with, you know, uh, a, a fully modeled uh, uh, 
um, environment uh, for buildings and, and such like that. Um, but you can also bring in uh, other types of layers like uh, WMS layers, um, uh, geo um, uh, layers, uh, um, KML, uh, uh, WGC. Uh, and uh, so that, uh, so for instance, um, uh, with this, I could uh, come in and I'm doing a lot of this stuff live to sort of uh, show that you can, um, uh, you know, where you can get some of this thing. So if we go like recent earthquakes, um, we can go ahead and find uh, something like a, a table of, of uh, earthquakes. Um, let me see if I can uh, find a... Uh, um, well, uh, they've actually uh, uh, changed the user interface a little bit, but if I take the, uh, a ta if I can do like an export of a table into this, um, where I can get any tabular data, I can come in and just paste it on Earth and then create a visualization layer for that. Uh, there's also an Excel plugin that you can use uh, to be able to link Excel to your Worldwide Telescope instance and be able to run that uh, interactively in, in real time so that if you make a change in a formula on Excel, you can actually see the charts update in real time um, uh, uh, in, the, in the simulation. Um, with that, I'm going to hand it over to David, and then after David's done, we can all take some questions and um, uh, then go into any specific features if people have any requests about asking um, about anything else. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to David for now. Awesome. Thank you very much. Sorry, I'm in the chat answering your questions. Cool. Uh, well, like you said, my name is David Weigel, and I'm the Planetarium Director at the Induta Planetarium at the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, currently working from home. And I want to give you a quick run through of how to uh, make some more advanced tours and do some keyframing. So let me see if I share my screen here. All right. So hopefully you can all see that and see a nice uh, silhouette of the Earth here. So uh, what we're going to do, um, and if you have Worldwide Telescope pulled up, you're welcome to follow along if you like. Um, so actually, let me uh, modify for uh, video playback as well. How do I do that, Mark? Uh, before you click on the... Um... Before you click on the stairs, you have to stop sharing. And when you're sharing it, um, there'll be a little checkbox underneath the view. So select the view that you, the screen you want to share, and then specify optimize for video. And it's at the bottom of that dialog box. Very cool. Okay, so this should be a little bit better. Uh, so let me know if you have any trouble seeing anything. All right, so we're going to go under the uh, tours pull down menu and create a new tour. And we'll say this uh, practice tour for key framing. All right, so uh, what we're going to do is try to take a look at somewhere beautiful on the Earth, zoom in, and then zoom away in nice fashion and head towards Mars. So we can either zoom in on the Earth, um, or we can pick a location by going to Search and clicking the little pull-down menu. Um, it's important to do precision clicking in Worldwide Telescope. So you could click the search, which brings you to this. Or if you click the little down arrow here, very precisely, you can find an Earth-based location. So for example, uh, we could search for uh, Grand Teton, which I like very much. and we can head to that and that will center us on it. And then we can zoom in and very nicely find yourself here. Uh, again, we're moving away from it. So we're going to pause time so that we don't lose it. I'm also going to turn off the cloud layer in here. So if I go over to the left side of the screen under the layer manager, under earth, under overlays, I can turn off the cloud layer. 
that will fade out. So going back to the tour I've created, I'm going to create a new slide. And when I create this new slide, as soon as I click that button, every single setting that's turned on is going to be automatically implemented. And if I zoom away and right click, and I set my end camera position, which uh, Jonathan already showed you, uh, I want to point out that it's important to pay close attention as to what you're doing, because if you set your start camera position, then you've lost what you've already done. If you show your end camera position, then you haven't selected anything, uh, these sorts of things. So uh, be careful what you pick, and we'll click set end camera position. So that's all fine and good. If we double click on that, we can get to the beginning, and over 10 seconds, get an idea uh, of what this looks like, this nice smooth interpolation if you don't have any streaming issues. However, um, maybe we want to fine tune things a little bit. And so that's where the rest of this uh, tutorial comes in. So uh, we're going to create a timeline and Worldwide Telescope allows you to have uh, sort of like a Adobe Premiere Pro video editing capabilities. So if, we're, if we right click on this, we can go to create a timeline. And this pops up this um, timeline at the bottom of your screen. And you can see that we have 10 seconds uh, set between here and that we have the camera. And if we click the little uh, plus sign there, you can see all the different parameters that are all wrapped up um, in these different keyframes. So at zero seconds, it tells you what our date and time is that pulled up on another screen. So you can see that the date is set at this Julian date. This Julian date. You can see what latitude and longitude are, that sort of thing. So we can also use the little scrubber here, and we can pull between different things. So this is very useful if you're trying to uh, fine tune um, with audio and that sort of thing, or simply just for your visuals. Okay. So uh, what I'm going to do is actually um, delete my. I'm going to minimize camera. So I sort of wrap all of those parameters up in one thing. I'm going to delete this keyframe at the end um, for ease of showing you what's next. So you scrub over to a different time. Um, if you are still situated on the beginning on 00, zero then you're going to overwrite your previous keyframe. And we don't want that. So we're going to zoom out a little ways. Let's go for right about here. The three seconds was arbitrary. We can change that later if we want. And you make sure that camera is highlighted, which it is since it's yellow. We click the add a key. And now over three seconds, we can scrub between the beginning and the end. OK, that's the same thing that we just did in um, the slide, but we can add different things to this, right? Because this is a, a nice view, and maybe we can we can drag this keyframe. Uh, let's set it to maybe six seconds, for example. Okay, um, but you'll notice there's there's no clouds on here. Maybe we want clouds to be on here. So if we have clouds at the beginning, uh, what we can do is we can right click on this layer and say Add to Timeline. And as soon as we do that, you'll see that it pops in here. And if we click the keyframe, you'll see that the opacity is 0, which means off. We can change that to any value between 0 and 1, which would be varying levels of opacity, 1 being fully on. And we can say that um, this is going to be instantaneously on as soon as this starts. So now we have clouds on from the beginning. If we click play on this, clouds are on from the beginning, having a little bit of haze, and we zoom out. And we see that they're there. Well, maybe that's not ideal when you render it out. So maybe we don't want clouds on from the very beginning. Maybe we want them to fade on at a certain point, say when we're right uh, here, for example. So we can add a keyframe right here. Let's turn this to off. This is for clouds. After about half a second, let's add another keyframe. Let's turn this one to on by pressing 1. You'll see that the transition function is linear. So we're going to go from 0 to 1 over this about half of a second. 
And we also are going to turn the beginning one to off so that we don't have any confusion there. So if we double click here and we click play, you'll see that no clouds. Then we transition to clouds and it looks a little bit nicer. So the benefit of this, of course, is that we have just made a pretty video uh, very quickly and that's not too shabby. Um, now, before we go any further, I also want to point out that we have these 10 seconds in this video and it's a little bit hard to see. So if you put your mouse right over where the numbers are, not here, not here, but right over the numbers and you scroll, you can either condense it, you can either condense it or you can make it a good bit broader. And I like to work with it condensed unless I need it uh, to be a little bit bigger. You can also pin it to your window and it can sit down nicely in the bottom. The reason to have it unpinned perhaps would be to clean up your workspace and have that on a different window. Okay, so we've got this nice view. We leave Grand Teton, we move away, and we get to the edge of the earth. Um, let us continue this. We'll go all the way to 10 seconds. Let's continue this and sort of push it to about out here. Okay, so play this one more time. We're linearly moving from point A on the Grand Tetons to point B. We're leaving. You see these uh, different things in the background. These are the different moon orbits uh, that looks like Jupiter and Saturn. And we could turn those off if we desire, and we could throw that in the timeline. Uh, but let's say we now want to go to Mars. So I'm going to extend this, um, this slide in duration. We're going to crank it up. Let's say it's going to be uh, 30 seconds now. So I change that, I hit enter. And when I do, it will ask if we want to scale it. So that means taking your existing keyframes and just spreading them out over 30 seconds, or if we want to extend it, basically concatenate another 20 seconds onto the end of our existing 10 seconds. That's what we want to do. So now we can see that after 10 seconds, nothing changes. So I'm going to jump over to Mars. If your timeline is closed in solar system mode, then you could simply single click or double click on Mars to get there. And so if we've lost the timeline, we can right click on this slide, go back to show timeline. And uh, we've, I moved the time over here. Um, this is a very short amount of time, but I'll adjust the keyframe after I've selected it. So let's just say, let's move the camera right there. And let's give this a lot of time. So we'll move this keyframe to another seven seconds. So let's watch from the beginning. We're leaving Grand Teton National Park in Wyoming. Clouds are zooming in and we're gently heading away from the earth and very rapidly heading to Mars. And then very abruptly Mars is here. So the reason this has happened, right, is because we're going from a distance away from the Earth to a distance fairly close to Mars, and we're doing so linearly over about seven seconds. And so in the interest of, you know, something visually pretty, uh, what we'd much rather do is get to Mars and be situated maybe, you know, right in here, and then more slowly zoom in. So this is where that keyframing comes in. So what I can do, you can see that literally we're about a frame away from being, three frames away from being um, pretty. So we can actually snag this keyframe right in here, pull it maybe over here, grab this one, bring it four seconds out, and sort of refine. So we've left the Earth. We're still going rather quickly to Mars. We could play around with the timing if we so desired. And then we approach Mars a lot more pleasantly. And we could play with that timing as well. You could uh, then zoom into Mars, which we'll do very quickly to sort of wrap up this keyframing tutorial to give you a sense of uh, what that might look like. So I'm going to change where we are there. I'm going to zoom in to whatever crater we're focused on. And actually, when we get to right about here, so let's, uh, let's set up that keyframe at this distance. I'm going to move it 
maybe 25 seconds. And then at 28 seconds, we're going to zoom in a little bit more. And by holding the control key and dragging up, I can change the tilt of the camera and move us in just a bit. And that should look pretty cool. So we can preview this, sort of see how that's going to flow in. And for kicks, we'll draw this out to the end of our slide time. We'll watch it one more time. And while we're watching that, let me look at the comments. OK, so the question is, um, in what situation would you create a new slide rather than extending the current timeline? And it, it depends a little bit. It depends on a lot of, I guess, what you're trying to do. Um, the slides allow you for some ease of of finding where different things are. So for example, I can name what this is, like this is Earth to Mars. So I can add uh, labeling to this, uh, which is nice. I can also um, right click on, nope, that's the wrong spot. Uh, if I do the pull down menu of tours, I can uh, show the slide numbers on this. So this is my first slide. You can assign audio specifically to slides. So that's a a specific use case. Um, you can have audio go over different slides, but you can also have audio specific to um, one slide. So that would be a reason to use one slide. And if you're doing, uh, if you're rendering this out as uh, specific scenes, then it's best to, in my experience, to render um, sort of slide by slide, and that typically helps a bit as well. So there are there are different reasons you might want to do that, and I'm sure I'm not covering all of them. I, I think of it as best as like organizing when you're using keyframes, you organize a, a set of a, a part of a related scene in that slide where a bunch of stuff is interacting. And then when you move on to something else that where you sort of shift, that's the time where you'd want to use a new slide. Um, if you use the basic um, tour authoring without keyframes, you end up with dozens of slides. Uh, you know, every time you move point to point or you change settings. Um, so essentially anything you can create in the, the simple tour, you can create as a single keyframe slide pretty much. Uh, also, if you change modes, like from sky mode to yes. uh, panorama to something else, you'll need to change slides because you are limited to one mode per, um, per slide. Yes, de definitely, definitely good points. Um, and uh, further, there there are means of having sort of open-ended slides where the user can interact, um, the viewer can interact with the slide, and so that's a, another means where you would want to have different slides where you're sort of uh, setting up parameters for people to interact with the content before moving on to the next slide. Um, and also, if if you're doing a planetarium show the slides would be moving through scenes. But if you were doing a kiosk, you could actually um, make a narrative that could branch off into several different ways. And each slide could be sort of a node on uh, the story graph. Cool. Uh, there's also a question um, from Ryan White about uh, streaming content, which I can assume that most of you are doing, or at least interested in. And if you want to stream with all of the um, sort of you know um, menu options, then you just grab the screen. But if you'd rather uh, just see the output, then you can go into the pull down menu of view and go into full dome, whether you're doing full dome or not, and detach your view to a second monitor if you have one, uh, or a third monitor if you have one. And from there, you'll end up. Let's see. Let me let me do that for you. I think I need to unshare because I'm sharing the application. So one second. So I'm going to detach my view to my other monitor. And then I will screen share the other monitor. There we go. So now you're just seeing the output. And so for example, I can play that same tour. And you get it a lot less cluttered. Awesome.
Awesome. Uh, so I think that um, gives at least a, a quick overview into keyframing and the ability to author. Um, let me, to conclude, let me show you how you can save this, uh, render this out as a sort of standalone content, if that's uh, what you desire. And let me switch the sharing one more time. I lost my Zoom menu, cool. Okay, one more, one more take. That's confusing. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, let's say you have this video, make sure you want to save it. So your save is uh, for your tour is up here in the top right of the screen and you can save it as whatever you like and it pops out as a uh, WW or WTT file. So you can save that there. Um, and then you can load it into any Worldwide Telescope instance, um, any Windows version, uh, if you have keyframing in it and it will play and render in real time, which is really neat. If you want to save it as uh, rendered out to a PNG, a PNG sequence, basically, you can go under the pull down menu for guided tours and click render to video. And then what you can do is uh, pick what your file name is, of course, and if uh, basically what your, your output settings are going to be. And you certainly wanna check, wait for all downloads all the time and then render it out and it takes a bit but it will spit out many many files and you just need something like ffmpeg or premiere pro or something like that to sequence them together and then you have a standalone movie either for flat screen or for the dome so all very cool stuff uh, so with that uh, i'll turn it back to um, Jonathan and or Peter um, for, I guess, maybe we're at questions at this point. So uh, we can uh, do some of the Q&A. So some of the folks are asking some questions on the side. Someone was asking, are there limits to resolutions? Um, I think, uh, uh, Mark, uh, you rendered 8K before. Yeah, the, the limits really come from your graphics card. So, so with the right with the right graphics cards, you can do 8K um, full dome. Yeah, the, the limits are that we need to be able to load all the textures in uh, at the proper resolution for the target resolution. So one of the things this does is when you play in real time, Worldwide Telescope makes a trade-off between all the textures that it needs, um, like for instance, sky or earth or planet textures. Um, it loads as much as it can and then uh, displays what's available when you're there. So it doesn't sacrifice real time. So sometimes the resolution is catching up. When you uh, print to a film, you can either do a quick mode, which will do the similar thing, or you can make it wait for all the content to have the highest resolution mode available. And what it will do is it will download all the content at the full resolution and then it will snapshot that as the, the, uh, the movie frame that gets outputted. And so uh, that takes longer to render, but will actually render a better quality image than you'd ever get in real time a rendering. But it also does mean you are taking up your entire, uh, um, you know, your GPU memory. So if you have a, if you have a really good GPU card, uh, you can render a pretty high res in it. And uh, I'll post uh, a couple. I have a, a couple samples, both of a real time render stream using Worldwide Telescope that I did, um, I guess, rendered out to uh, through OBS as a screen grab um, for a, a video I did for the 30th anniversary image from Hubble uh, on Friday, which the entire process took, you know, maybe three takes of me speaking and 30 minutes. Um, so I'll post that in the comments here right now. And then there's also a video, um, a sort of hype video for the New Horizons flyby um, of, I guess, the then Ultima Thule, now Ericoth, uh, that we put together that was a good bit more effort and rendered out as frames. And you can kind of compare and contrast uh, the difference. So I'll add those to the comments right now if you're interested. Um, so 
some of the other um, uh, questions about like when you use slides. So there are some special uh, modes like crossfading and fading in and out and things like that. Uh, so for instance, you can uh, crossfade from an earth view to a sky view or from one sky view to another sky view. And um, when you do, one of them can be in motion and one of them will be frozen. Um, but that, that type of transition only works when you're between slides because it's um, a, a part of the, the, the sliding. There are some other tricks you can do, for instance, like fading to black by putting a rectangle, you know, a black rectangle object over the whole screen and then fading that in or out. Um, and other types of things like that. But um, um, there's a print to film rendering um, that separates from real uh, time frame output. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my uh, screen uh, again, or my app here. And um, let me um, go ahead and uh, um, okay, let's see, screen one here. And uh, so in their tours here, uh, there's the, it's called render to video. Uh, so if you guys can see this here, you can specify the output folder, you can specify the output uh, type. So for instance, Dome Master 8K. And then this mode right here that says wait for all downloads. And uh, what this will do is all the internet um, downloads that it has to do for like um, earth and sky textures and image tiles, it will download all of them before the frame is outputted when you're in this mode. Um, if you're just doing pure animation, uh, this doesn't make all that much difference if, if you don't have a planet or the sky involved. Uh, but this will... Um, uh, do um, uh, that output, uh, um, you know, so that it will not save the frame until the best resolution is available for every single tile. Um, there are also a couple of other things you can do in, in view. You can copy, uh, if you need to copy a particular view um, to a clipboard, save it to a file, uh, set your Windows desktop for that image. Uh, you can also output, uh, so for instance, if I go in here to Mount St. Helens, um, I can um, come in here to Mount St. Helens and um, I can export this area um, as a, uh, a, a file for 3D printing. And so uh, this uh, will then actually create a 3D um, uh, STL file that can be 3D printed. So if you want to print a mountain or, or a crater on Mars or something like that, you can actually output it from Worldwide Telescope and then print it on a 3D printer or send it to a service. That may be one of the strangest features in a planetarium software ever. Uh, so looking at the comments, um, yes, I agree. That's really rad. Um, looking at the comments, let me clarify that. Um, so you can, if you want to do live streaming in a worldwide telescope, um, then you could do something like using an OBS uh, or, or some different sort of software to grab whatever your screen is in real time. So you could stream that or you could save that to video. And that works, um, you know, quick and quick and dirty and, and quite well in my experience. Um, if you want it to be absolutely uh, perfect, um, then your option would be the render to video, which exports a sequence of image files that you then have to sequence yourself. Um, and you can bring that into a video editor outside of Worldwide Telescope to sort of finish the publication. Um, so, and Ryan is saying they've been using StreamYard and I haven't tried that. So that'll be something cool for me to check out. But yeah, so those are those are your sort of um, different options of how you might go about that. Um, and I guess also, I don't know if we pointed out, but you can also um, use Worldwide Telescope with uh, the Oculus Rift, which is really fun. Um, so you can create tours for that, um, or just you know fly live yourself, which um, 
takes a little bit of getting used to, um, sort of God mode and the universe is overwhelming um, if you are just flying live, but uh, those are super cool to do as well. So someone asked, can WWT, um, uh, set up WWT for 20 meter planetarium with six projectors? Um, it all, the, you know, the projectors are all what matter. If you can, um, a worldwide telescope has uh, modes to be able to do single projector um, display on one laptop where you can actually do the master and then send the output to a dome projector, uh, either a fisheye, a warped mirror. Um, you can also use a one computer as the master and then run image generators on a whole cluster of machines. I think at Adler at one time there was uh, two sets of 20 machines and so there was uh, t uh, 21 machines involved in rendering a show um, uh, because of the number of projectors they had. Is that correct, Mark? Okay. And um, so um, at uh, University of Washington, um, we've got had six projectors set up there that are then rendered by a cluster. We've you can um, now actually um, uh, use the uh, uh, SkyScan um, uh, configuration files and load them into the latest version of Worldwide Telescope. Um, through, through a strange uh, coincidence, <laughs> Sean was involved in uh, uh, helping out with that, and uh, we basically were able to get our uh, uh, people uh, technology um, um, uh, te technologists together to be able to um, uh, read the same file format and be able to output it. Also, if you have Uniview with um, the uh, uh, Open Scene Cluster or Open Cluster Render, whatever, the, the, there's a specific version of the uh, type of configuration files that Uniview uses. You can also load those into Worldwide Telescope and then uh, render off those projectors. But basically, it's just a cluster of projectors um, you need a warp and blend solution um, that uh, will calibrate that. Worldwide Telescope has a built-in calibrator inside that can be used. Um, it's not necessarily the best uh, in the world, but it, it does do one thing really well, which is if you don't, if you can't do a photographic calibration, um, you can still use the Worldwide Telescope. Uh, for instance, uh, if you have a star ball in the middle of the planetarium like they did at UW um, when this software was first created, uh, it still allows you to do a calibration and do a solve on it. Uh, we were working on uh, a photographic calibration system. We haven't uh, shipped that yet, but if you have another uh, calibration from uh, another vendor, uh, many of these can be basically saved uh, um, into the Worldwide Telescope's configuration to be able to use them to, to render. Um, and certainly if you have something that just um, uh, sits between the computers and the projectors to do all the warp and blending, uh, you just need to set up a few parameters for each projector um, um, and it will just render that way. So I think that's, that's the first version of uh, the setup that we did uh, with Ryan and and Cal Academy, all we had to do was enter the, uh, um, the uh, uh, you know, like six parameters for each projector. And a few of them we had to make some intelligent guesses at. And after a while, you know, put off, it, it was rendering nicely. Uh, David and Jonathan, one of the, the questions, the number of questions we've gotten have to do with uh, terms of use. Um, whether it's good for commercial or for streaming or things. Uh, can you guys speak to that for us, please? So the um, only qu question about it from a software perspective and all the data that's under control from um, Worldwide Telescope is all free to use for commercial or non-commercial use. The code is all for commercial and non-commercial use. There are some issues. If you are using commercially uh, some data from some things, I think, like Sloan Digital Sky Survey or some other specific people, they have some terms that have, they've allowed us to send it out, uh, you know, for non-commercial use, it's no problem. Um, the um, issue becomes if, um, if you're using a data set from somebody else 
that um, has a restriction. Uh, so for instance, if you bring in you know, um, data from AM and H that has a license uh, for it um, that, that has, requires a commercial license for use in the show, um, you know, Worldwide Telescope may be rendering it, but if you don't have a license to the underlying data, then you know, that you'll have to deal with with the, with the vendor. It's not something that, that we do any licensing. All the stuff you can just use from us, but we may be curating data from other people that do have non-commercial use uh, restrictions on it. Um, but I think there's very few, like I think maybe the Sloan data and... Um, Peter and I were having a background conversation while these were coming in and trying to uh, give you a, a better answer. And um, it, it's sort of a case by case basis. So um, I guess the, the, quite, the bad answer is um, to figure out what you're trying to do and then we can help you on a more case by case basis depending on what the data is um, and try to give you um, a better set there. But that, that's probably something that we need to have some set in stone um, documentation on. Other questions? Okay, so, oh, so there's a question about how to share um, tours with the community. And um, there are a few ways. Um, you can work natively through the Worldwide Telescope communities, um, but we are recommending at this point that you use our newly formed forum, uh, newly formed forum. Uh, so that's www-forum.org. I'll be posted to it at the beginning and I'll post to it um, again. And um, basically you can upload that there and uh, share with people. And also have your questions answered and that sort of thing and that helps. So if you give a WTT file, um, attach it to email, put it up in a web, uh, a Google Drive share or Live Drive or however you want to sync it to someone else, if they can get that Worldwide Telescope tour file and they're connected to the internet, then they can play it. Um, Dantel asks, could you show a quick overview where multi-channel projection um, uh, parameters are entered? So um, there are, um, I'll go ahead and show a few of the different ways here. I'll do a um, uh, screen share again here. And um, uh, so the uh, traditional multi-channel dome, sorry, of a truck passing, two trucks passing. Um, so there is under settings, advanced multi-channel calibration. Um, and this right here is sort of the native um, built-in Worldwide Telescope uh, projection. So if you have like a six channel system um, that um, works this way, essentially you would be able to name your projectors, you'd be able to uh, go ahead and, and click on them and um, each projector would have a, a native field of view and then um, a, a projection and, a, and um, uh, this basically is the um, uh, tells you where you're um, go, what you're going to render as a por portion of the sphere and then how that's going to get warped onto the projector. Um, a lot of this is uh, we have this ability to basically drop a bunch of correspondence points. So what you can do is um, you'll actually uh, name your projectors, you'll um, uh, then go ahead and drop uh, points uh, on. So there'll be like a red and a green point and you'll align all of the corners and the overlaps of the projectors like that. And then you can have it do a solution where it'll actually solve the uh, uh, projectors and create a warp and blend that will um, get rid of the seams on that. This works reasonably well um, if you tweak it um, it's not necessarily uh, very automated, but uh, it, it can come up with a, a pretty good solution and a lot of people are using this. But it's preferable 
to be able to have something that um, is a um, 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 a configuration that's that's based on a, a commercial uh, setup. So, for instance, here um, in Worldwide Telescope Config, these are uh, the the distortion files and the blends and things like that. We have here. This is one that's showing how you would use it with uh, um, with a, a sky scan. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and bring it up in Notepad, and and here we're just basically um, pointing to the render head file that's used by SkyScan. And so basically all we do is point to the SkyScan file and when it sees this um, uh, um, uh, header inside our config file, it basically hands over the entirety of the rendering to the SkyScan setup. And then the SkyScan setup itself then has all of the the, the uh, warping and blending um, uh, parameters in it. So then, if you already have a sky scan set up, you could basically reuse that file. Um, in the case of um, Uniview, uh, there's also a similar uh, view, um, a, a similar way to do that. Um, oh, let's go ahead and and screen share back one more time. Sorry. And then there's one other aspect of it, which is um, if you're using a single projector dome, uh, you can also use um, you can also use uh, the uh, uh, dome formats where you can actually uh, 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 use a warp and blend format. And this is um, uh, gosh, what's his name uh, in Australia? Paul Burke. Paul Burke, yes, Paul Burke's uh, 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 format. So we we ha have built in a few options here, but you can then use a, a custom warp file. Um, and so basically what that does is um, uh, tells how you want to warp the, the pictures of what's rendered and uh, from a, a, a either a flat or a full dome image and how you want to project that. So you can create custom projections with this. Um, in fact, uh, I think, I think it was, um, again, Mark, uh, at Adler power user, um, he had a power wall and he wanted to get rid of all the bezels. And so he actually, um, created a, a warp and blend solution that basically eliminated the bezels on his power wall. Um, so you can use it for all sorts of strange things like that as well. Um, so there, there's actually like five or six different uh, ways of, of doing these things. Sorry if this is a little bit more uh, uh, tech heavy. Um, anyway, other questions? Uh, I think I'd like to point out too that um, if there is something that uh, you're interested in doing in the, the documentation, um, isn't there for you or, or you're having any trouble, please do reach out um, on our forum and we're happy to help and, and get you going in the right direction um, because there are plenty of things that um, we don't know what you want uh, documentation for. And there's certainly limited time on our end to make documentation and that sort of thing. So um, let us know how you want to use it and um, we can try to help us as best as possible. Question, uh, in the far out view, the distant galaxies are very dim. Can you brighten them? Um, so the uh, um, we don't have any direct um, you know, slider or anything like that for the galaxies. I'm not sure if you're talking about that you've actually uh, uh, um, saying that, that they look dim in the presentation or in uh, an actual use, uh, Patricia, you were making that comment. Um, yeah, when, when you when you when you zoom out to get that large scale structure of the universe, especially right. if you put it on a mirror on a dome, it just it gets very it, it's so dark it's hard to see. Even on a flat screen, it gets hard, dark, and hard to see. Whereas I know the data is there; it's gorgeous, but it's just so low contrast you can't you can't see it. 
Okay, so what I would suggest is maybe what we need to be able to do is, is provide that as a, a, a calibration, param a setup parameter that's, uh, that we can put in our dome config. So um, this can be an example of uh, if you have an issue with the software, we have the uh, community site um, and our GitHub and, um, or you can get a hold of one of these people here and basically it's probably best if you uh, sign up and make the uh, feature request or bug report, and then uh, we will work to try to make it happen. And one of the, the things is that we, a lot of uh, our, we're very responsive to our customers. If you're using it and you're complaining about something, we know you're using it and we, you, you, be, you go to the front of the line in terms of the stuff that we can, uh, um, that we can uh, uh, that we will work on right so um, and if we have multiple requests or people who are um, if you see another bug report or a complaint and you come on in and you say hey me too and this is another observation I'm also having that issue or something then that helps us raise it to uh, uh, to uh, up at the priority and so then we can work to get that fixed so thank you for the suggestion um, and we can talk offline if maybe there's some other ways that we can do it because it is a challenge to try to do something that will look good on every type of display because sometimes you have a very high output a dimmer display or sometimes you know everything looks too clumpy uh, on some displays depending on on the gamma and so um, one of the things that we did uh, work with is that um, if you have a multi-channel projection, you can change the gamma and that will actually help out on, on everything, right? So it's not just the galaxies that need boosted, but some other things that, that um, um, and the Worldwide Telescope, there is a cluster controller that's a separate install WWT remote. And that also has the ability to do remote gamma control as well. So you can actually globally adjust all your projector gamma um, remotely. And what's neat about that is that doesn't um, cause any um, aliasing from um, uh, from having uh, to use the 256 colors because it actually changes the the output um, of the uh, uh, of the display and and the output maps on the display. So it it, it uh, doesn't affect your dynamic range um, or cause any um, um, solarization or stepping in your images. On a, a less technical note, um, one thing that I think we only really glossed over is that um, everything that we did here today is in the Windows client, uh, which is what you would need if you were doing something um, in the planetarium itself. Um, however, if you are doing live streamed activities um, or if you're doing something, uh, particularly something where you want um, students or the public to follow along, you can use the web version, uh, which is at www.worldwidetelescope.org, which will jump you right into the web client. And um, it's it's pretty much, it's almost exactly the same minus the ability to do keyframing um, in tour. So it's something that uh, is very, very powerful and very easy um, for whoever to access and follow along with whatever you're doing which really allows for some great hands-on activities. And uh, so far we've had some, some decent success uh, with doing that in this whole uh, work from home fun. Um, so definitely recommend it if you're interested. We had a question or an observation um, about languages and language packs. So we are uh, localized in several different languages and there is, um, you can create your own language pack with Worldwide Telescope that you can load in so that if you uh, you essentially translate a whole set of strings. You bring it into like Excel and you have like several hundred strings and you just translate them uh, into your localization, save that out as a, as a file, and then you can load that in and Worldwide Telescope's UI will adapt to that. Um, specifically also, uh, the uh, China VO has forked Worldwide Telescope to have a lot of Chinese cultural uh, issues as well. Good to, good to see you, Ryan. Have fun on the jet.
All right. Well, if we if we have no further questions, I think uh, the one thing we'll try to do with the event page on Facebook uh, is to have everyone's contact information. So, uh, Jonathan, Peter, and David, if you know we could get that from you a little bit later, um, be able to put that online. That would be great.